the objective of uh, today's uh, uh, discussion is generally to give a overview of uh, ADR. I'm sure most of uh, the people here who are experienced uh, in whatever field they are doing uh, would have come across ADR uh, in their activities. Um, so they'll have some idea of what it means. And of course, we have people like uh, Dr. Lemay and others who are a little more into the legal aspects of uh, this alternate dispute resolution. I actually got into this uh, ADR, not uh, today or yesterday, uh, somewhere in 2005, when I started Sir, so there is a voice is muted. Voice is muted. Then you should have told me much earlier, no? <laughs> no, only, no, only it is muted. Just oh, I see. Ten minutes. Okay, okay. I think ten seconds. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, fine. So what I was telling was that I got into this field of arbitration um, way back in 2005 um, when I started a website called arbitration.in and wanted to bring uh, some kind of... Uh, mediation and arbitration online. But as it always happens, that was again too early. I think happened for quite some time. Um, so subsequently I relaunched that uh, as odrglobal.in and uh, we made some efforts, but uh, still uh, market was not ready. But uh, right now it appears that uh, from several directions, there is a push for this uh, uh, online dispute resolution. Of course, you cannot have an online dispute resolution unless you understand what is alternate dispute resolution. So both go hand in hand. Okay, so we will discuss uh, some basic aspects of this uh, ADR today and then see how it can be used by FDPPI um, when it wants to develop as a specialized institution for all disputes relating to uh, personal data protection laws, both Indian law as well as uh, laws from um, other countries. In fact, uh, when we have various training programs, our idea is to create that expertise and that expertise has to be somewhere uh, utilized. Okay, so we will uh, look at this agenda of understanding ADR, relevance of ADR, then briefly look at the different types of dispute resolution like negotiation, having an ombudsman, mediation and conciliation, arbitration, all this as alternate to the judicial system, which we are all familiar with. Many of our contracts today have a jurisdiction uh, class, but most of the time we sign uh, contracts with our people, uh, accepting jurisdiction of a foreign uh, court. Many of uh, times I think it is there on paper, it's very difficult to make use of that. Now we will also briefly discuss this ODR as a platform. So as the name indicates, uh, we are talking of uh, this alternate date, uh, dispute resolution, which is alternate to the traditional uh, uh, system, which is legacy system, where uh, we go to the courts. We all know that uh, going to the court is uh, something like the last resort, it should be the last resort, because the time required for uh, resolution is uh, uh, huge. And uh, there is, uh, too much of uh, formalities, uh, technicalities involved. Uh, therefore, it becomes very difficult to pursue justice in uh, the courts. So there has been a talk about this alternate uh, methods of uh, finding a resolution for a dispute. And um, the need for that goes uh, up every day. We, I don't want to get into any statistics. Um, but what ADR tries to do is to close the disputes um, so that there should be no need to go to the courts. And uh, people can go to the court only in very exceptional circumstances that will reduce the burden on the courts also. Ideally, uh, arbitration or any other alternate dispute resolution must be more economical and it should also lead to better uh, decisions. It can save time to a resolution also. Now, as professionals in the data protection area, if we look at why this is re relevant uh, to us, we all know that the data protection officer, as envisaged either in the GDPR or in our proposed Personal Data Protection Act, 
he is the person who has to receive compliance from the public, which is the data subjects or the data principles. And uh, data fiduciaries themselves enter into a lot of legal contracts with either a data processor or any subcontractor. So there are contracts all around and uh, disputes arising from people. In uh, PDPA, there is also an organization called uh, Consent Manager who has a lot of uh, individual clients uh, with whom it has some kind of a data processing uh, contract. So the same way data fiduciary uh, has uh, to solve, resolve disputes with the data principal, the consent manager also is a data fiduciary and he also has to resolve the disputes with the individuals. Many times the individuals come up with compliance which are uh, really not, uh, you can say, sustainable uh, in a court or whatever is that. But uh, there's just a push one email to the company and say, please let me know whether you have my information or if so, uh, where did you get my information? It is very easy for them to send an email, but uh, to answer that, even in the negative, for the company, it involves lots of resources. So many times it uh, becomes a harassment on companies by individuals who simply raise questions where Really, there is no issue of privacy um, infringement, but uh, because uh, there is a law which says there is a right to the data uh, subject, uh, right to access, uh, right to correction, right to delete, or something like that, uh, people tend to um, misuse the legal provision uh, to the detriment of the corporate entities. So companies uh, need to have some kind of mechanism by which these complaints are resolved without much of a problem. Normally, we have our uh, complaints handling uh, system, uh, which is our help center. Normally, help center is able to resolve most of the technical uh, uh, questions which are raised. My service is not working, my password is not working, something of that nature. It can be handled by the help center people. But whenever a customer raises an issue which has got an element of legal dispute, then this help center will perhaps only complicate things uh, because they may not have the right exposure to law and sometimes they say something or uh, provide some solutions which are not uh, good enough in law. I have many times explained how uh, in my one of the first cases of our cyber crime against uh, that uh, Umashankar's case against ICICI Bank, the bank uh, told the customer uh, in, the, uh, in the first instance, please wait for 30 days, we will do some internal investigation and then uh, you can take a decision on giving a complaint to the police and so on. So we had an email from the customer service cell saying that please wait for 30 days. It so happened that when the case advanced subsequently, we were asking for uh, the CCTV footage uh, in the bank's premises. Uh, somebody else who was replying to us at that time, which was six months uh, later, uh, told us that uh, we normally keep the CCTV footage only for 30 days. And since you did not ask us uh, for the CCTV footage within 30 days, we have deleted it. So we are not in a position to provide it. So when we held, uh, this earlier email to them that you only asked us to wait for 30 days. Now you are saying that within 30 days you are going to delete the CCTV footage. We said you are uh, in complicity with uh, the fraudster to actually destroy the evidence. And uh, we put up that argument in the adjudication and other things and try to also say that this becomes an offense under section 65 of IT Act. So the health center people, if they don't understand the legal implications of what they are saying, as a customer service representative, they simply said, we will take care of your request, give me 30 days, give me 15 days. But that becomes something like a suggestion for forbearance and if any action had to be taken within that time and it has been deferred because of the suggestion from the company, then uh, the company is actually taking on a liability. Therefore, this normal health centers will not be capable of handling disputes of legal nature and in data protection, most of the queries which we receive from the data uh, principles, they have something related to the legal uh, side of it. And therefore, 
if the help center person is not able to recognize that, he will not escalate it to the appropriate uh, party uh, in the organization, appropriate higher uh, authorities. But otherwise, most of uh, the issues need to be resolved from the point of view whether uh, there is a personal data involved, whether uh, there was a commitment to protect that data, whether the consent covered the usage, um, whether uh, there is uh, really a need for uh, uh, giving the answers to whatever the person is raising in a particular manner. All that has to be handled like a dispute. It is not a complaint. Complaint becomes a dispute if uh, there is a possibility of uh, some liability getting uh, attached to it. So as data protection officers, people will have to be very much um, aware that most of the complaints are those which may be called as disputes and uh, they are not simply uh, some operational uh, uh, issues. Plus, we always uh, know that a data protection officer, in whatever way it is envisaged in GDPR or in our Personal Data Protection of, uh, Act, he is a person who has to be a jack of all. Uh, say, on the one hand, he should know technology and be able to review a data uh, protection impact assessment. On the other hand, he should have uh, the PR ability to handle this customer uh, complaints. In between, he has to deal with the seniors in his organization, a CISO or somebody like that, and try to ensure that uh, he gets the right kind of uh, information from them to be submitted to the data protection authority and so on. Therefore, a data protection officer will be exposed to a lot of uh, internal conflicts, okay, with peers, uh, superiors, even subordinates, external regulators, and so on. Therefore, any skill which we normally try to imbibe in a person who is into a mediation or negotiation uh, kind of an activity will always be helpful to the DPO because he is constantly a negotiator, he is constantly a mediator with various conflicting uh, interests. So whatever we discuss as requirement of a arbitrator or a mediator particularly is very much relevant to the person who is designated as a data protection officer. So to that extent, we all need to know more about this particular uh, skill, okay? Uh, in fact, we are intending that uh, in our next module on uh, this behavioral skills or uh, audit skills, which we are going to take for our uh, certification course, we want to have some additional sessions exclusively on this ADR uh, capability. Uh, this was one of the plans which we had. Since we have not started that, we have not moved in that direction. Now, looking at our Personal Data Protection Bill 2019, this is one of the Data Protection Acts, which specifically mentions that the data fiduciary should mandatorily have a grievance redressal mechanism before the disputes reach the adjudicator. Of course, our law has an adjudication system. Adjudicator is part of the data protection authority. And then we have the uh, cyber, uh, the appellate tribunal. They are the formal uh, legal systems. But before that, within the company, we are supposed to have a grievance redressal mechanism. Now, what is this grievance redressal mechanism? It cannot uh, end with only the help center. It has to be more than that. So normally, we say that it has to include um, at least an ombudsman, um, if possible, a mediation. There is a slight doubt about arbitration uh, because if the law has provided for this adjudication uh, as a methodology for resolution of the uh, uh, disputes, we cannot have an arbitration in the real sense. So in real sense, an arbitration is one which has to be self-sufficient to the extent that the need to go to a court should be uh, not uh, necessary. But when the law has stated that there is an adjudication, it will be difficult to bar a person from going into the adjudication. Therefore, we need to always have what uh, uh, we can uh, call as an adjudication system with uh, recourse to the other uh, legal uh, uh, measures 
subsequently. So at least uh, there will be uh, like an initial attempt to resolve the uh, problems. Then uh, when we go to the adjudicator, the, both the disputants have already tried some uh, kind of a negotiation in a very serious manner. So we may have that kind of uh, arbitration, but mediation is always possible. So that's why we say that mediation is an essential aspect which should be uh, incorporated in any data fiduciaries uh, compliance uh, uh, program. When you say privacy by design, privacy by design should include uh, even the dispute uh, resolution. In GDPR, there has uh, not been, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, section 32 of PDPB, which uh, also specifies this uh, 30 days limit and all, which is uh, essentially guiding towards uh, um, better system of uh, dispute resolution than um, a mere, uh, as I told you, the technical uh, handholding of uh, complaints. Now, as far as GDPR is concerned, GDPR does not specifically mention about this kind of requirement of a data fiduciary to have a grievance addressal mechanism as a mandatory process. However, there is a mention under Article 40 uh, under the codes of conduct that uh, GDPR suggests that associations and industry bodies will try to have some kinds of uh, practices which will allow for out of court proceedings and dispute resolution, which means that they are envisaging uh, this uh, mediation and arbitration, not at the company level, but at a, an industry level. But in India, since we have this adjudication at the higher level, we can, and all, there is a mandate uh, for the company level um, dispute resolution in a proper manner, we need to actually institute this ADR process if possible within the corporate uh, system of a data uh, fiduciary. Now, when we talk of conflict resolution, we talk of uh, this negotiation as the first aspect. Um, negotiation basically means that uh, the parties under dispute, they themselves try to mutually arrive at a consensus. Um, and in fact, uh, negotiation always is involved, even in a mediation, even in an arbitration. Uh, it is a more or less a standard first step in dispute resolution. But uh, compared to the other aspects, negotiation means there is no third party involvement. The disputing parties themselves will try to negotiate and come to a particular kind of an understanding. Now, the next level we normally suggest most of the companies to have is uh, setting up an ombudsman. Ombudsman basically means that there will be a respected third party who is suggested by the organization as a person who can uh, look at the complaint of a customer and then perhaps suggest a resolution. Uh, though ombudsman is normally appointed by the company and uh, people may say that he tends to favor the company most of the time, uh, if the ombudsman is an independent person with uh, some kind of a respect, the customers who have got complaints may be ha happy to refer their complaints to the ombudsman uh, so that it is better than the vice president of the company uh, giving a resolution than uh, because there is a vested interest if the company official himself uh, provides some kind of a resolution. Whenever I've got a complaint against, uh, let us say, a product uh, uh, having been sold by a company and I say your product is not good and if that complaint has to be handled by that customer himself then obviously he has got a vested interest to justify his product. So then there is a separate uh, person called ombudsman who is uh, not uh, so obliged to the company uh, probably the resolution will be more easily accepted by the customers. Now so this ombudsman is something uh, which most of the companies can uh, use and uh, there are uh, many organizations who have appointed an ombudsman and the complaints of certain nature at least will be referred to the ombudsman. Now beyond this uh, we have this mediation. Now sometimes mediation and conciliation are two terms which we try to use more or less uh, uh, as an extension. We'll uh, look at that mediation in a little more detail. Arbitration is the uh, 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 next level of uh, dispute resolution beyond mediation. 
If both of these fail, then of course we always have the judicial system. Now, when we look at this mediation, what we mean by mediation is that a dispute is there. Now, we have a third party who will try to intervene, bring clarity to the conflicts of the two people, and um, in a way, help the people resolve the conflict themselves. So it involves a lot of counseling, perhaps. And if the person has got experience in the industry, he will be able to discuss with these people and then perhaps uh, convince them that there is no point in taking this uh, dispute to the court. Uh, both of them will not be benefiting by that. But instead of that, you can have a give and take approach. You both of you will be better off. Um, he may suggest something, but normally in a mediation, the mediator tries to keep his uh, involvement in arriving at the decision to the minimum level and only use his skills um, in man management to make people realize that what they are asking is unreasonable, what the other person is offering is reasonable. So after two, three levels of discussion, um, the parties themselves may come up with some kind of a negotiated settlement, okay? And finally, at that time, the mediator will try to help them clarify the aspects, convert that agreement into a uh, sort of a written uh, version of uh, a mutually agreed uh, statement of uh, commitment. And uh, both of them sign it off. Uh, so mediation ends up with both the parties agreeing to a mid middle uh, position. And uh, because both of them have agreed, uh, that uh, becomes binding on both the parties at the end of the mediation. Of course, mediation is not binding in the sense that uh, at any point during the mediation, both persons may say that I am not agreeable to the suggestions and we back off and then continue in any other manner. So mediation is a non-binding attempt with the uh, intervention of a third party to bring about something like uh, yeah, an assisted uh, uh, agreement uh, to resolve the conflict. In that, the word conciliation is normally used when the mediator tries to be a little more forceful and tries to use his, uh, say, um, weight of uh, respect he may be having or the knowledge he may be having uh, to uh, push up the parties into an agreement, okay? Instead of uh, having a completely hands-off approach, if he starts uh, quoting uh, the legal provisions and try to make them realize, etc., then perhaps that is where the, there's a small difference between mediation and uh, uh, conciliation. But otherwise, both um, are non-binding uh, arrangements where an a intermediary tries to help the two people uh, resolve. Arbitration, on the other hand, is somewhat like a replication of the court, but instead of the judges uh, and the legacy system of a government appointed um, setup, we have more or less like a private uh, court. Arbitrators are actually chosen and the system of arbitration is accepted by the disputing parties by having an arbitration clause in their agreement itself. So when they enter into a contractual agreement, in the contractual agreement, they agree that if any dispute arises, so we will try to settle it through a system of arbitration. And of course, there is a, an act called Indian Arbitration Act. So normally that is quoted that it will be done as per this Indian Arbitration Act. And they also suggest that there will be an applicable law like the Indian law or whatever is applicable to that contract for interpretation of the uh, dispute. And uh, they will also agree upon where the arbitration is going to happen, whether it is happening uh, in Bangalore, whether it will happen in Delhi, or whether it will happen online. So the seat of arbitration is decided, the applicable law is decided, and the system of arbitration how under the uh, law will also be decided. Normally, the uh, arbitration clause will also state uh, whether there will be a one arbitrator or uh, three arbitrators. Normally arbitration is always the odd number of uh, people. So sometimes it is mentioned there. Sometimes what uh, contracts do is they 
contracting parties agree upon a contract i mean uh, arbitration uh, tribunal or uh, they uh, will not call it as a tribunal maybe arbitration council or uh, a team and then say that uh, we will refer this to this arbitration uh, council and that arbitration council will have certain rules that rules may decide how the arbitration complaint is uh, being uh, handled so the contract will simply say we will decide uh, this dispute uh, by referring it to such and such an arbitration council it is that kind of a status uh, is what i am now trying to see whether we can uh, take fdppi to be a preferred arbitration uh, uh, center uh, so that uh, at least in data disputes kind of a thing we become a preferred uh, organization where uh, the disputants can look up to now arbitration system may have uh, lawyers representing the parties uh, where, uh, where there can be witnesses evidences can be presented so uh, all the legalistic aspects of uh, the court may be used here compared to a mediation in a mediation sometimes even though one party may have a better legal position he may always agree to come down and then agree for the benefit of uh, retaining the relationship etc so mediation decisions are not always completely as per law whereas arbitration uh, has to be as per law because if it is not as per law and uh, there will be a further dispute because in the case of mediation at the end of mediation the two parties agree to sign off uh, what they have agreed to in the case of an arbitration once the presentations everything is over it is the arbitrator who provides an award so it is like a judge pronouncing an award and if he does not do it in a manner in which it is fully acceptable or compatible with the law there is always a possibility of a dispute though normally arbitration strike to preclude appeals as a routine matter of course you have seen that even today there was an amendment made to the arbitration act uh, 2015 um, where in uh, some aspects of uh, appeal and other things have been uh, addressed uh, separately uh, but ideally an arbitration should be an end of the dispute it should not be necessary to go on an appeal unless we are saying that the arbitrator was prejudiced he did not have a proper methodology he did not give opportunities to the people to present if that the process is corrupted then one can one should be able to go to the higher courts um, today from arbitration act we normally go back to the supreme court directly so there is a provision for appeal in case the arbitration system has not been handled properly other than that uh, most of the cases arbitration is considered as a finality and even when an appeal is uh, preferred the courts um, are uh, very much reluctant to admit the appeals they sometimes try to yes, say that uh, we will not like to accept the appeal so arbitration has that kind of a binding nature uh, and try, tries to close the dispute uh, there itself now the question is um, how do we pay the arbitrators in the case of judges they are getting the salary in the case of arbitrators uh, they are paid by the litigants there is a cost of arbitration normally it is shared uh, but the person who makes the first claim he will be the person who has to perhaps take the cost at least in the initial uh, uh, proceedings and if the arbitration doesn't succeed he will have to perhaps take the entire cost uh, subsequently of course if the uh, decision is in his favor maybe he may get some uh, cost otherwise in the original uh, uh, contract itself there should be some kind of a uh, mention about how the cost of arbitration will be uh, uh, shared so otherwise the person who makes a claim with an arbitrator or the arbitration council and asks for resolution he is the person who takes the cost the cost will involve the fees professional fees paid to the arbitrators plus the uh, costs which are uh, payable to the councils the lawyers and in a case like this odr where a platform is also required a technology platform the technology costs will also be part of the cost which the person has to incur so that overall there is a cost even here
but uh, compared to the costs in the court where uh, it may appear low in the beginning but because it drags on for years on end the net cost will be higher arbitration is a much better uh, system in fact in the indian arbitration act uh, uh, 2015 amendment the government wanted arbitrations to be mandatorily completed within a period of one year and if it is not uh, completed because of the uh, anything uh, reasons attributable to the arbitrator they wanted the arbitrator's fees to be moderated down something like that but that i think has been removed now but the effect of arbitration through this uh, uh, act is to see that within a reasonable time the uh, process is uh, completed so that the costs in terms of time and uh, uh, you can say opportunity cost for a businessman to engage in litigation is brought down to the uh, minimum so um, basically uh, the uh, options of appeal is limited and arbitration is a finality okay we, if any questions are there i will take it a little later uh, let me just uh, complete some of the basic things which are uh, are required to be completed so there is a typical arbitration uh, clause um, which says that all disputes arising out of this contract will be uh, resolved uh, through arbitration which is a key word has to be used and uh, it can be through online arbitration uh, if you want uh, normally since i have this odr global.in as a platform i suggest people why don't you put it as online or Online need not be mandatory in the sense that arbitration can be a hybrid nature. Uh, it can some hearings may be online, some hearings may be offline. Yeah. Go to a hotel, uh, book a room, and then have it. Uh, take the cars. People will have to travel from different places online. At least that is not uh, required, but it can be a hybrid nature. So that is the seat of arbitration has to be part of that. And then the arbitration shall be subject to the provisions of Arbitration Act. How many arbitrators are there? These are the things which have to be there in this uh, typical arbitration clause. Okay. Otherwise, uh, the process of arbitration is that there should be a provision in the contract. If there is no provision in the contract, but a dispute arises, and at that point, if the parties want to go into arbitration and not go to the court, it is open to them that even if the original contract did not have the arbitration, they can agree on an arbitration uh, arrangement subsequently. In fact, nowadays in most of the civil cases, you go to the court, court itself will suggest that you please go and have an attempt at mediation. And when court directs you to go for arbitration or mediation, that will be given only to certain, you can say, specified institutions who are working under the court system um not uh, entirely the private system which we are otherwise talking of uh, where if you add it in the contract before you go to the court you go directly to a arbitration uh, panel and uh, try to resolve it then uh, uh, you can go to any panel of your choice that is your choice means that uh, the two parties uh, are together but when you go to the court court will direct you to a specific arbitration uh, system which may be uh, affiliated to the court and at the end of it they will come back and report to the court directly and then the court will continue the proceedings subsequently that is how um, the court assisted court directed arbitration mediation is uh, uh, handled now otherwise contractual provision should be there selection of the arbitration panel will be either in the uh, contract by designating that okay i will use karnataka arbitration council or something like that or fdppi then the rules of that organization will uh, apply then um, when a person may want to make a claim he has to send the uh, uh, notice uh, through the uh, send the notice uh, through the arbitration uh, uh, council and then uh, if the respondent responds so then uh, documents will be exchanged uh, hearings will be fixed it goes on like that until the award is done execution of the award again is always a problem even if a uh, court gives an uh, verdict many times uh, uh, executing that will be a problem the same problem will also be there uh, in arbitrations uh, at that time if necessary you may have to go to the court for execution okay now 
one of the important things which we as professionals are interested in is who can be the arbitrators. Most of the current arbitration councils, uh, we always see a retired uh, uh, judge of particularly from High Court and Supreme Court. But arbitration is not meant to be only a post-retirement uh, job opportunity for judges. In fact, ideally, it should be the domain experts who have to do the arbitration, except that in, since arbitration is a legalistic uh, resolution, at least one member of the arbitration panel should be well versed in law. You can call him as the chairman if you want. So normally, one person need to be good in law because he does not want decisions to be taken in a manner in which it will be questioned on points of law in a higher court. But other than that, if the disputes are related to, let us say, a particular domain, uh, engineering domain, or any other, uh, say, in IT, uh, kind of a thing, a software development or something like that, a domain expert being in the panel will always be helpful. That is where the arbitration uh, proceedings permit non-judicial persons to be also the arbitrators. In fact, until uh, the ordinance of today, okay, what uh, the 2019 amendment uh, stated was, of course, uh, uh, the Arbitration Act provides uh, the details of who can be an arbitrator. One point uh, about arbitrator uh, is that there should be no conflict uh, situation. That is, the arbitrator should not have at any point of time in the past dealt with as an advocate or something with either of the disputing parties and so on. Other than that, um, the 2019 version had given a specific guideline um, under uh, Schedule 8. In fact, this was what um, I have also pointed out uh, for our FDPPA norms, it said that an advocate, a cost charged accountant or a cost accountant or a company secretary with 10 years experience or somebody who has been in a senior position in an uh, organization having uh, substantial experience, which would be 10 years, they can act as the arbitrator or judicial officers if they are there, it's fine. So. The persons who have been senior level officers in the government or even in the private sector can be arbitrators because arbitrator is the choice of the two parties. If both the parties say I want X as my arbitrator and they are confident about uh, the uh, expertise, that is acceptable under the uh, particular act. So that is how it is being uh, decided. The uh, only thing we have to see is, is the background of the arbitrator in relation to the parties involved. That is where conflict uh, should not be there. Not only today, but if this person has been a consultant to one of these companies two years back, three years back, then also we can say there is a conflict. So accepting that conflict situation, expertise is the key uh, based on which we can have the arbitrators. So. When we come to the data disputes to be settled in accordance with the provisions of say Personal Data Protection Act, we are expecting that the arbitrators are having expertise in data protection laws. That is where FDPPA kind of organizations come into it. There are also councils who will have to assist the litigants. So there are two levels at which expertise can help. Some experts can assist the litigants in putting forth their claims or defenses to the board, uh, the uh, appellate, I mean, uh, the arbitration uh, panel, or if they are senior enough and if they have got that attitude towards uh, pronouncing uh, a decision on uh, the basis of uh, uh, the presentations made by people, that is the judicial mindset if they have got, they can become the arbitrators also. So at both levels, opportunities are there for domain experts to act. And uh, we hope uh, that is uh, where our FDPPA will help. Now, since we are in a COVID kind of a situation, even courts are going into e-courts, the possibility today is to explore the opportunities of a virtual arbitration. And in fact, this is what I have been uh, talking about in ODR Global for a long, long time, that uh, unlike, for example, the ICON system, most of you are aware that uh, domain name disputes are handled by ICON uh, through WIPO, 
and we sometimes refer to it as uh, uh, say uh, online dispute resolution but actually in that online dispute resolution complaint is raised by email responses from an email something like that so use of emails alone is considered as online arbitration or online decision but what i feel uh, as a better concept is to have a virtual meeting room in which the arbitrators are sitting councils are there parties are there and of course uh, in our odr global system we have a registrar who will be there to record the proceedings of an arbitration diligently and also of course what your global also provides a section 65b certificate for the entire proceeding so that this arbitration recording becomes a legally valid document of course so this recording is not relevant for mediation because mediation is always has to be done in confidence it has not to be recorded it cannot be produced uh, later on in another uh, litigation but arbitration uh, is not like that so odr global is a platform which has been adopting uh, such methodologies in fact right now uh, you know that uh, when the information technology act came uh, to the world uh, it was based on ancestral model law on e-commerce same way ancestral tried to develop a model law for odr for it worked for several years for developing the model law finally um, uh, in uh, 2017 they said that we will not give a model law but we will give a sort of a technology note which can be used in fact whatever we are using in odr global it meets the standard of the ancestral model law as it was envisaged before 2016 and it meets all the technology requirements which are uh, uh, contained in the latest ancestral technology uh, notes and uh, therefore uh, if fdp pay starts using the odr global uh, kind of a platform we are already there in a model which is having uh, the uh, sanction of the united nations uh, uh, system so we are, i am suggesting that fdp pay should specialize in this uh, it will also give an opportunity for our specialists to actually have some kind of a revenue generation through these uh, kind of activities which will only go on increasing over the years okay because a very cyber crime which we are talking of today most of the cyber crime becomes a data related uh, dispute and if there can be a mediation if uh, if there can be a compounding if there can be an arbitration that will uh, provide lot of uh, opportunities for professionals so this is uh, in general a overview of the adr uh, system um, probably we will now take the questions so that whatever we have not covered uh, we will be able to cover uh, as i told you mediation we are going to have one more uh, session from an academic professor also yeah uh, now any questions on this Uh, sir durai here um, yeah. i have one naive question so to be an arbitrator uh, arbitrator uh, do we need do we in the sense the fpp need any legal licensing or any enrollment <laughs> say arbitration is a voluntary aspect of uh, i and you agree and say i want sudarshan mandiam to be my arbitrator okay nobody else can say no because it's only we are the persons who are uh, coming together no so that way arbitration doesn't uh, require a licensing as of now but if it is a court directed arbitration that may go to accredited arbitration institutions okay but private arbitration can be uh, an arrangement uh, of the litigants okay that is my view maybe mr uh, limaye if he has got any other view he can always um, add kya yeah, limaye no no sir it is perfect yeah okay thank you sir thank you okay but if you want to be a, i mean arbitrator you should your credentials should be attractive for the two people to suggest normally in the disputants uh, if there are three arbitrators uh, what happens is each disputant will uh, suggest one arbitrator and uh, there will be a list of people from whom a choice can be made and uh, either uh, 
those two arbitrators will perhaps choose a third person. Something like that arrangement should be normally be made. So if FDPP is going into it, we will have a list of potential arbitrators whose services can be used. Okay. And of course, uh, the fees and other things normally, if it is done under an umbrella of an organization, we should have certain uh, kind of limitations. Of course, Arbitration Act itself suggests certain fees, but that is um, a recommendation. Uh, actual fees can be either uh, more uh, or even uh, uh, less. So within that, uh, we can provide a list of potential uh, arbitrators, what are their credentials, what are their specializations. Then the litigants may say, okay, I want this person as my arbitrator. So that is how choice can uh, go. Okay, but arbitrators should not have conflict, as I told you. And secondly, if they, they should have at least some, uh, at least one person who is a legal minded person who can write judgments kind of a thing. The award is actually like uh, issuing of a judgment. So. While technical people will assist the person, the person who actually signs off as an award, he should know how to write judgments. So to that extent, some uh, legal expertise is uh, uh, required. Uh, so if you are having a three member panel, one person will have to be mandatorily a legal expert. Uh, the others can be the subject uh, experts. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Yeah, any so, other questions? Yeah. So, Minalal here, I have an observation yeah. and, in fact, a suggestion. Um, so, what I'm observing of late, the way laws are being made uh, and the authorities are being created, and I would draw an example from Consumer Protection Act, which came in 2019, and the mediation regulations, which came in 2020, July 20, they have a provision of attaching a mediation cell to the National Consumer Disputes Redressal Forum. Now here, I'm, if I draw a corollary with the data protection aspect, there will definitely be a data protection authority. And with that authority, there will be a need of certain mediators to be attached. And uh, you know, some institutions can help uh, registering some people as mediators. So that is, we should keep that in mind. And as soon as the data protection authority comes and there is a scope of some something like this, obviously independent, regardless of developing our own skill, we should keep a watch on that as well. Possible, but uh, we cannot ask, I mean, uh, demand it as a matter of right. But if we have the reputation, then informally the adjudicator may suggest that before coming to me, why don't you try to do something uh, mm -hmm. uh, with such uh, mediation uh, Council or something like that. Um, maybe it will be difficult to make it mandatory from them. If it happens, I will be the happiest person. Um, mm. So okay. But otherwise, uh, we are trying to uh, work one layer below the uh, adjudication uh, yeah. level. Uh, Correct. Try to present it to the parties that before you go to the adjudicator and pay the adjudication fees, we will try to help you resolve. If we fail, uh, then you can go there. Our fees is so much, so. There is a cost here also, but it has to be reasonable enough for somebody to say, uh, we will try here before we go to the adjudicator. Then if we have a success story, a couple of success stories, then the adjudicator will himself will suggest uh, other parties, yeah. why don't you try this? Yeah. And also, sir, let me bring on table one information that in January this year, the Supreme Court has constituted a committee to suggest a code for mediation. So that also possibly once that comes into existence, probably that will be useful to for the purpose of regulation of mediation. Yeah, see, mediation is different from arbitration. As I told you, if I and you are having a dispute, but finally we sit and agree on something that I give up something, you give up something, and we agree to sign the mediation, uh, no other court or something needs to have anything more, yeah. uh, more to say. The person who facilitates this as an assisted settlement, uh, he is a, uh, you can say, expert, skilled uh, mediator. Yeah. And skilled mediator is actually a person who can handle people better. Okay, yeah. basically that is uh, more uh, uh, required. Arbitration is different. Arbitration has to be in accordance with the law. They should, their, their action should not be questioned in the court of law tomorrow on a point of law. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that means so, 
so that's the point i'm making that even when people are invoking the provisions of arbitration act the courts are insisting in some sense the courts are insisting that first you go and do a mediation if the mediation fails then you come back to me so mediation is really an activity which is emerging and it's a thing of the future yeah agreed that's what i said but uh, that is where court directed mediation normally it goes to the uh, uh, associated accredited uh, i mean uh, arbitration council for example in um, family courts there will be a separate set of this thing in bangalore we have got the state uh, arbitration council promoted by the high court kind of a thing so court is not likely to direct it to a private arbitrator mm. okay so private arbitration has to come before we go to the yeah that's true yeah sir yeah. madam's observation is perfect yeah. because uh, what uh, chief justice of india is advocating is the need for alternate dispute resolution to get rid of uh, many matters so this is genuinely a future of uh, say law profession that uh, adr and what uh, we are thinking as far as uh, data arbitrators likewise so that is uh, emerging concept and it is quite possible that with inception of uh, uh, data protection authority there could be a inception like what has recently happened in consumer protection act so mediation facility could be inducted immediately so if we get opportunity we can give this particular suggestion to present panel means uh, jpc if opportunity is available so it can be incepted right now in the inception stage only so that uh, if possible can be recommended yeah right now it is not there in the provision but uh, it can be added later on in fact mr ashok patel whom i have invited he heads that uh, counts uh, mediation uh, uh, center of nlsui which i think is an accredited uh, thing for consumer uh, uh, disputes okay but of course because it was national law school i think uh, the consumer uh, council has uh, accepted that so tomorrow if uh, fdpp also has such a independent stature and dpa thinks that uh, we should be accredited uh, it may happen yeah sir so, uh, this is jitendra sharma i yeah. just want to ask you on the arbitration you said that arbitration is usually the final step and courts don't like to uh, admit the you know appeals against them but uh, if you look at the large uh, the famous cases for example the vodafone has done some arbitration we are still challenging it there is some arbitration which is happening in the reliance and future deal in past also uh the renbexi promoters against the japanese uh, company again that was the ch- there was a challenge so how does is is the international arbitration uh, not acceptable to indian uh, laws or not international what? arbitration can also be there and uh, see because it is an agreement between the parties it is binding say what happened was prior to 2015 amendment the old uh, arbitration act 1996 the appeals were more common but in the 2015 version one set of uh, i mean uh, suggestions were made to reduce the appeals but uh, you know that when the stakes are very high uh, the uh, arbitrators also can be inefficient they can also be corrupt or even if they are uh, genuine and honest people can always attribute saying that no no this decision is not acceptable to me because the arbitrator did not uh, do things properly the reason why in odr global i am suggesting the recording of the whole session is to ensure that if an arbitrator has genuinely done good work he should not be questioned in a court of law saying that this arbitrator did not do the proceedings properly and therefore it has to be um, ac- accepted on appeal so um, the idea of arbitration is to reduce cases to the court so that fundamentally is there in implementation sometimes we may not be able to get it done properly but uh, as the arbitrators become more uh, i mean efficient and also they are if they are very honest then um, the possibility of appeal should be less but in a general system you don't know what has happened inside the room no even the courts until today they were not interested in uh, exposing the court proceedings to the public only now supreme court is trying to soften its uh, stand because no judge wants to be accountable 
So similarly, no arbitrator also wants to be accountable. So what we are suggesting, at least what I am suggesting in ODR Global, which may not be liked by judges who sit as arbitrators, is that I am going to record the entire session. The registrar's duty is to record the whole this thing. I am going to give a certificate under Section 65B. This video file will be a valid document, electronic document in a court of law. It can be used to the advantage of the arbitration council. If the arbitration has been done fairly, transparently, then even if the appeal is made to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can look at these proceedings and say, and everything has been done fairly, there is no need for an appeal. But if something has not been uh, uh, correctly done, then perhaps appeal may be accepted. See, even in the Supreme Court, one judgment of one bench is always appealed to the other bench. So like that, there is always a possibility to say that the earlier bench did not uh, take all uh, things into consideration. And if the Superior Court uh, finds there is a prima facie case of something not having been handled properly, then they can uh, take on the appeal. In fact, in the, two th the amendment which came today was regarding granting of stay. This 2015 uh, amendment had more or less uh, discouraged granting of stay. They said appeal should not normally happen. Even if the appeal is accepted, the award of the arbitration uh, council stays so that if a financial uh, award has been given, the party has to make the payment and then wait for the appeal decision. So today's amendment of the ordinance, what it says is that if there is a prima facie indication that the award was not reasonable, that is if the Supreme Court or the court thinks like that, then they can grant stay also to the award. Okay, so uh, it was two step forward and one step back kind of a thing. Earlier in 2015, they said that appeals will curtail to the extent possible. Now at least stay is possible. Uh, hopefully, as we go forward, the appeals will be less. Most of it will be decided here uh, at one level because evidences, witnesses, they're all uh, done. So it's like a trial court having completed it. So when it goes to the next court, it becomes almost the appeal court. And in the uh, Indian Arbitration Act, it goes directly to the Supreme Court. So you are avoiding the multiple uh, layers of judicial uh, intervention. So, um, I did question to this. You said the, both the parties will agree on the arbitrator, whereas yeah. in the case of Vodafone arbitration proceeding, the one of the government official has stated that we don't know uh, unknown party. Can, how can they challenge the sovereign right of India? Uh, you know to amend the laws. So, uh, uh, government must have agreed to the arbitrator. So, what will they will it hold the water as for you? Uh, no, I, without going into the details of that, I will not be able to give a proper uh, this thing. Say, I think Vodafone, uh, this thing was uh, an international private arbitration, okay, which people were not happy with the decision and they went to the Supreme Court as an appeal. At that time, they might have imputed that the arbitrators were not uh, qualified or whatever is that, and uh, uh, there could have been some uh, observations. I am not fully aware of that. Maybe if uh, Lemay is aware of that, he can comment on that, or if Anupam. No, I think that, that is just an argument that is being forwarded by the Indian government, because yeah. when you challenge in terms of sovereignty, one can even extend it to the question of public policy. And even in the earlier discussion, when an award is passed. We also have to look at the provisions of the Civil Procedure Code, which talks about the award which needs to be enforced. Like even in an international uh, arbitration award, which is passed by a CIAC or a LCIA, they will have to be enforced in India in a form of a decree that the court will pass. And therefore, the award becomes effective. So automatically, the award does not become effective, of course. And even if you look at historically, arbitration as a mechanism of an ADR, of course, the intent was to resolve the numerous cases and the backlog and reduce all of that. But to a larger extent, it has not achieved what it had sought out to be. Therefore, the amendments that have happened, including the amendment in 2015 and the one which has happened recently. So I think, therefore, now mediation is also being looked into, which earlier was not really thought about. Of course, it's more like a parties agree on mediation and it's not sort of enforceable. It's before you get into a dispute, hopefully some 
issues make it resolved before you actually knock the courts or the uh, you know courts or go for arbitration also just make a suggestion with respect to the odr global website so just as we have arbitration rules you know you have the uh, now the mumbai i think uh, mcia is also there in based in mumbai similarly for odr global also perhaps we can work towards forming some kind of rules you know and even like have some kind of classification if, if a, say a dispute is of say 5 lakhs this x percentage of the fees so everything would be very transparent and people would i think would look at it in a more structured manner and perhaps eventually people will get attracted to also to okay, this forum okay. i have actually some model rules and other things but what i have uh, tried to do is keep odr global as a platform and okay. let arbitration councils with their own rules use this as a platform say for example if uh, your company uh, wants to enter into arbitration if you are already doing arbitration it is fine you are doing it with a hotel or whatever is that now suppose you want to use this as a platform you you try instead of hiring the room uh, in a hotel or something like that you are hiring the time on this space um, that is the only difference so odr global is more like an intermediary who provides a infrastructure for this over and above that the uh, organizations which uh, take the responsibility for uh, running the uh, arbitration they actually become the arbitration uh, bodies that is that is how i wanted to do so that sure. responsibility of odr global global is not like an arbitration council or institution okay it is only a platform so now sure. fdppi has got a different role fdppi can be an arbitral institution uh, using the platform of odr global that is possible because fdppa uh, is an independent entity with its own expertise okay right sir thank you so odr is like a marketplace anybody can use it correct that's what correct. i yeah. agree agree fdppa is one which is good okay, which is going to use right. that and uh, what odr yes. or global may do is some back end services it will give say suppose you don't have your clerk to send notice and other things i will do that for a particular service that's what it says but if you are in we are uh, existing arbitration council you have got all infrastructure as i told you instead of hiring the hotel room you have to hire two hours or uh, three hours of this time that is the only difference okay whereas if you are an indiv individual who wants to do it now you have to send a notice receive the notice and then uh, uh, do a lot of uh, back end administrative things that is where uh, odr global may give some uh, back end uh, uh, like a para legal services uh, uh, prior to the actual hearing okay so even then it is only a platform kind of a thing i would like that to be a platform uh, but fdppi can be a little more than a it's a different kind of platform it, it is a decision making it's like in a cloud service you have got infrastructure service over and above that a software is running and then somebody is using that application like that here also it will be multiple layer correct anupam right sir yeah so even in terms of the target you know like i think msmes could be a great forum because you know they always lack way to go should there be a dispute because i mean 98% of you know if you see the global production or even indian production is all msme dependent they are the backbone of the country so that's a big catchment area it just needs some kind of perhaps promotion we have, we, we have mr shankar narayan here he has does he have any view on this shankar narayan